Morning all, um, welcome to today's meeting. Uh, I'll kick off with the minutes of the last meeting held on 26th of January. Are there any comments or amendments, Mr. Burt? I can try turning off. There we go. You might, you might have the wrong control chair. <laughs> um, I, I do have one uh, query, page 13 of the minutes. This is um, uh, a classic one. Councillor Cowan, uh, it's in quotes, Councillor Cowan explained that it was a fair comparison. Um, I would suggest that he didn't explain, he just declared that it was a fair comparison. Um, and if you want to, it's in the audio, it's one hour, 33 minutes into the meeting. Okay, uh, I agree with your point. Um, could um, could explained be changed to stated? Any other proposed amendments? None. Okay, could I see all those in favour of accepting those as the minutes? Then, please, with that amendment. Thank you very much. Those are carried. Uh, apologies and substitutes, Ruth. Thank you, Chairman. We've received apologies from Councillor Kybird and Councillor Braham, and we have Councillor Askew a substitute today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chairman's announcements, there are none. Items of urgent business, there are none. Declarations of interest, do any members have a declaration of interest they want to bring to the committee's attention? I see none, thank you. Non-members wishing to address the meeting, I'm not aware of any, and I see none indicating Philip, are you wishing to address the meeting under this item or you're just here as usual for the, for the fun of it all? Very good. Well, the standard rules apply. So if you wish to speak on any item, then please indicate. Um, item seven, Councillor Call for Action from Councillor Nairn, which is the grass cutting and verges. I believe, Rihanna, you have a presentation. Oh, no. No, no sorry. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. Sarah, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chair. Now, Rihanna does send her apologies. She couldn't be here today, so um, I'll be presenting. So it has been, um, it was raised at this meeting around the concerns that Norfolk County Council had reduced their um, number of grass cutting per year. So as requested, I just want to provide an oversight as to how this process and how it happened. Um, the next slide, please read. Okay, so in your pack, I provided a timeline. We initially made contact with Norfolk County Council Highways back in September 2020 to advise them that our current surf contract with Serco, who undertook our grass cutting, was coming to an end, and therefore we wanted to ascertain what arrangements they wanted moving forward, if they wanted us to continue with the current arrangements for grass cutting or any changes. We received contact from them a month later just to confirm that they were at consultation and whether to see if they were going to change their grass cutting arrangements. Uh, in the next year, February, we received confirmation from them that for urban cuts, they would be reducing their cutting regime to four cuts per year. This was significantly different to what Breckland had previously done on their behalf of grass cutting we cut consistently throughout the growing season which does tend to be roughly fortnightly depending on weather and seasonal effect so this was going to be a significant change to the grass cutting arrangements in order to finalize that we held a meeting with them in march 21 um, where they confirmed that they actually wished to continue the current arrangements so we built that into the Serco contract and made sure they were aware that Norfolk County Council wanted to continue as before. But unfortunately, a month later, Norfolk County Council then advised us that they wanted to, as previously stated, reduce back down to those four cuts per year. And in turn, they wanted a 20% reduction in the overall cost. As we discovered this in April 21, we had already commenced grass cutting um, that generally commences March time. 
So we had already started on the usual regime of the fortnightly cuts. We then, so of course, this was a concern to us that we were now being asked to cut four times per year. We then received a further email from Norfolk County Council advising and confirming that they no longer required Breckton Council to cut the grass at all with effect from April 22, and that they would only pay for four cuts for the 21-22 year period. This, in order to not disrupt the service for our parishes and towns, we actually chose to maintain the and continue with our regular cutting schedule. We felt that was important. We had already started the cutting schedule in 21 as usual. So we felt it was really important to maintain that for um, our communities. So even though Norfolk County Council had requested a reduction, we did continue with the standard we had been previously with the fortnightly. So at, now we had been formally advised that from the 1st of April 22, that Norfolk County Council wanted to only pay four cuts per year. We couldn't actually agree a point, a price point for that. We were in contract with Serco. We had committed to them to pay for the significantly higher number of cuts per year. And therefore came, Norfolk County Council actually chose to ask us not to do it anymore. Um, and we couldn't come to an agreement, which is why um, that actually we had to take steps to actually remove it from the contract. Um, so Serco on behalf of Norfolk County Council completed their final cut in October 2021. And as from January 2022, we actually removed the grass cutting on Norfolk County Council's behalf from the Serco contract. Um, so that's sort of a whistle stop tour. So we certainly, we approached Norfolk County Council early on in the process. And I think the timeline demonstrates that. We did act proactively make contact with them to establish what grass cutting arrangements were going to be moving forward. Next slide, please. As you can imagine, we were very aware that this was going to most probably cause some concern that grass cutting was effectively for all land owned by Norfolk County Council going to reduce from what we were currently offering of a roughly a fortnightly cut down to four times per year. So in order to mitigate and ease any concerns, we issued a briefing to all members. We also provided town and parish councils with information about the changes and in that we included maps so they had a clear reference point of who owned, who was responsible for cutting um, the Breckham Council land and also where the, change, the difference was for the Norfolk County Council land. So they could clearly have that like in a map showing the different responsibilities. We also briefed both our call centre and the Serco call centre ahead of these changes so that they could handle any calls at first point of contact and give information. I am pleased to say that I think the amount of work we did prior to those changes in informing people did actually mean that we only received a very small number of calls at Serco with regard to the reduction in grass cutting. So I think that was very positive actions we took did have an impact in reducing contact. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay, I wanted to make sure um, the grass cutting arrangements we do, Breckland and Norfolk County Council do cut grass for different purposes and I think it's important to recognise that. As Breckland, we predominantly cut for amenity purposes. Um, we do cut throughout the growing season and that can generally, as I've said, be cut fortnightly depending on the weather and the growth. Norfolk County Council cut for safety reasons. They do cut for very specific reasons and it only cut between May and September. They also distinguish between urban areas and rural areas. With urban areas, the verge is being cut four times a year, whereas in rural areas, they are only cut twice a year. So it's a significantly different cutting regime to what we do at Breckland. Next slide. <coughs> oh, thank you. Um, so as they 
it's really important i think that people do understand where they do need to report things to so that they can get the quickest response so i just wanted to give you reference points of the best point of contact to report any issues to Breckland Council and if it is a Norfolk County Council issued their contact details to go directly to them so just so you have those direct points of contact for your reference in case you do have any issues thank you has thank anyone you got much. any questions uh Councillor Nairn then Councillor Wilkinson the it's more of a, an observation than a question in as much as that with the verge cutting, particularly in the rural areas, we're finding, or, you know, my experience has actually been that the, the two cuts are insufficient. In addition to that, on the minor roads, they are using this motorized grut digger. I don't know whether you've seen it. Um, and quite honestly, a lot of the times, when you're driving along these narrow roads, you do not know where the gruts are. And if you pull off the road to allow another vehicle past you, I know of about five or six people whose cars have been very, have been damaged by this. In terms of the um, urban areas where those grass cutting, yes, they are cutting it four times a year, but they're cutting it so short and what have you, that it really is ruining the ecology of that area whatsoever it really is far more damaging than it is doing any good um, and i have on occasions tried to contact the the county council through that medium um, to be told well we don't know which contractor is doing it because apparently they've got four or five contractors throughout the county who work and that, that's my observation thank you peter yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. That was going to be my um, question to, to Sarah. Do you know who, who, what contractors they're using? Because um, that could come into the situation if, they, if they're not carrying out the work. Um, unfortunately, we aren't given that information, so it's not something that we could um, advise you on. By all means, we could follow up your concerns on your behalf, um, but it is um, ultimately Norfolk County Council make the decision as to which contractors they use, so we have very limited ability to influence. Yeah, I, I'm going to say, um, because last year was fairly dry and a lot of the verge grasses didn't grow too much, but a lot of the amenity grass did, because I've got a piece in front of me and, and my next door neighbour went to cut it, because it was people was letting their dogs go in there and then uh, during the night and, and, and you couldn't see where the dogs had been because of the height of the grass. So there is a health issue there that you should be made aware of. Thank you, Chairman. So I, I very much appreciate the, uh, the difficulty of this, uh, this current situation and this uh, conflict between um, the district council and the county council and, I, and it, you know, recognize that uh, we as district council are actually doing a much better job. Um, I, my query would be um, how a member of the public would know where the responsibility lies. Um, and I followed the link that you provided in the slides. And the first question it uh, asks there is, is that land uh, public, private or unknown? And which is a fair enough. And only once you've done that, you can then move on to the next stage to identify the piece of land that, uh, that has overgrown grass. But um, there's no, uh, on the mapping facility, there's no indication as to which bits are Breckland responsibility. And uh, would it not be something that we can put an overlay onto the map to, to say that this, this is where our responsibility lies so that at least it's clear to members of the public what happens and if not and if it is an area where um if we can't do that once they've reported it do we automatically pass that report back on to norfolk county council is there a tie up between the, the two reporting functions yep certainly if we are given um if a query is raised about a piece of land that isn't in our ownership we will do our best to identify where that ownership lies and we'll pass it on to the appropriate owner whether that be Norfolk County Council or if we can identify the landowner if it's private 
we will pass that on um, and we will in turn update whoever has raised the issue. Sorry, um, overlays, I can, I can certainly, I can pick that up with our digital team. I don't honestly know the capabilities of the system, but I certainly, I understand it does make sense that that would be an instant point of information for people to see, but um, I can pick that up with the digital team. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Just a couple of points if I may. Um, firstly, just to say thank you for the, the sort of narrative that went with the timeline, because I certainly found that very useful. So uh, it's uh, good to see how the sort of decisions are arrived at. <clears throat> um, 2021 was quite a bad year for complaints about grass cutting. I remember some quite significant complaints across the district, less so last year, purely, I think, because of the heat, frankly. So it'd be interesting to see to what extent those complaints come back if this is a, an ordinary year. Um, the two points I wanted to make, well, firstly, it is incredibly frustrating from a uh, member of the public point of view, but also councillors, because um, some of the reasons for the reductions of cuts has been driven by what they claim to be sort of environmental concerns. It is completely illogical to have multiple teams going to different areas. So in Fetford, we have Norfolk grass, we have Breckland grass, we have town council grass, we have flagship housing grass, all cut by different teams, different contractors, different people overseeing those contracts. Um, and it really is a good example of a lack of joined up thinking in local government in, in, in my book. So um, not good for the environment and not good financially either. So it's very frustrating the position we're in. And um, I wanted to pick up, if I may, on um, the last point there, what Tim was saying, because um, if we are receiving complaints uh, from the public about issues that are not Brecon Council's responsibility and we are acting on them, as in we are following up as a council uh, and following up with Norfolk County Council or others, then that is really encouraging. But that hasn't been my experience. Very often when I submit things on the reported site or if I report things to officers and it turns out to be not a Brecon issue, that becomes the end of it. And I'm quite encouraged if it is the case, Sarah, that we are actually now proactively dealing with things because the last thing the public want to say is not my problem. If we are as a council saying, actually, yes, it isn't our problem, but we will contact and report this to Norfolk County Council or encourage people to report it to the correct place themselves, I think that's a major step forward and I'm really pleased about that. Thank you very much. Any other comments from members? Seeing none, okay. Uh, I think we can simply note the report. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that. Um, you are free to leave or indeed free to enjoy the rest of the items on today's agenda. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so next item is Queen Square Parking Trial Attleborough. Um, Councillor Hewitt, I believe you have a report for us particularly for me. Thank you, Chair. I'm pleased to present this report to overview and scrutiny this morning for noting. Uh, the contents of this report are a direct activity that's been undertaken to support the Council's corporate plan, specifically our thriving places objective, just one activity where the Council has played a role in supporting how well our high street centres and high streets thrive. Helping our high streets and supporting our communities with employment, retail services and choices has been a key pillar of the work that this council has undertaken before and during COVID and in the recovery afterwards as high street habits continue to evolve. And using our car park assets to help and assist our high streets uh, as they continue to recover has been critical uh, as demonstrated in the report today in the car park trial that we ran in Attleborough on the Queen Square, Queen Square car park. The initial request for the trial came from the town council. It was of course developed in a truly collaborative approach with us, something that has worked well here and has also worked well in the past. The town council understood their town and understood how changing car parking habits was assist in their town to recover and to develop uh, over the last couple of years and in the years to come. We of course used our experience with Swatham as set out in the report. So we had a formula that 
we could use to reflect that in terms of Attleborough, although the reasons and the approach in Attleborough for Queen Square were very different, as Attleborough is, of course, very different from Swatham. As you can see in the report, we undertook extensive consultation at various points in the process, as well as during the trial itself. Chair, I've said in the past and will continue to say, people do not mind change, but they do mind being change. And changing habits can be difficult. However, I hope the Commission agrees with me that we undertook the trial in a controlled and considered way. And after a successful trial, I'm pleased that we've now in the process of moving this to a more permanent arrangement. Commend the report for noting, Chair, and I have got my colleagues to the right-hand side uh, if members of the Commission have any very specific questions to ask. Thank you very much. Questions from members? Councillor Burt. Thank you, Chair. Um, could I take you, please, to page 24, paragraph 3.6. Um, Councillor, it says that it's uh, been a success, um, and maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. But I think when you look at this paragraph here, um, the feedback report says that 58% uh, support uh, a short stay. That is a very low percentage, considering that there will be far more people using it as a short stay than a long stay. And fewer than half the respondents, 6%, supported increased parking availability. These are really inconclusive figures and they tend to towards the trial not being particularly successful. If I take you to further down on the same page uh, to paragraph 3.9, um, it indicates there that each space is used just 3.3 times per day. Now that to me, uh, appears to be very poor utilisation for a short stay car park um, and surely uh, it, there's, there's some text in there that that if the full three hours were utilised but surely in a short stay car park you're not going to expect people to be there for the full three hours um, and that seems to be painting a uh, an, an unrealistic picture. Certainly when I've uh, used that car park, it's been for considerably less than three hours, mm -hmm. um, which is the intent. So um, I don't think that this is necessarily the uh, outstanding success that is being painted. And I think some other options may need to be considered. Um, for example, and this is merely an example, I'm sure that there will be other things you could do. Um, have you thought about um, uh, splitting the car park to long and short term spaces? Thank you. Um, I'll give the team and Councillor Hewitt an opportunity to respond on that, should they wish to, uh, and then I'll go to David. I have to respond to that, Chair. Um, you're absolutely right that we've obviously put the data in the report exactly as it as it came forward. Um, obviously, you know, at the end of the day, we did have more responses that supported. Uh, moving to uh, uh, the short stay offer and making that more permanent than responses that didn't, and it is 58% and 42% and, and um, said otherwise. Um, but it led us to a, a position where we had, we had a majority in terms of the quantitative data. We also um, had the qualitative responses. So we had to sort of blend that with the quantitative data to see what people were actually saying. And we were really considered, I think, about what responses came back from the public you know not just in terms of sort of like answers to specific questions because i think it's a really important part of the of the consultation um and and, and that's why in 3.7 we've just highlighted some of the, some of the comments uh, that came um but in response to that um there were further follow-on actions which relate to your point councillor burt around could it have been split between three you know part of it between a short and part of it between a long stay um, we've got a finite amount of car parking assets and car parking spaces in the town um, that we, uh, we control. Um, and that obviously led us to thinking about, could we make Queen Square permanent? But what also was the feedback telling us about, you know, the other, perhaps using the other car parks that we've got in our control in a, in a slightly different way. And that led to the decision and the outcome where we were um, a looking to extend um, the uh, three hours to four hours because that's what the consultation response told us that people more people would prefer having a longer short stay period at that particular car park but also 
there are a lot of responses where people were saying, actually, I need longer than three or four hours, you know, for, for appointments, et cetera, in the town. And that's led to some follow on work in the other two car parts that we've got to move those two car parts in a sort of stage two to a long stay facility. Uh, and unfortunately, they're the car parts that we control and they're the ones that where we can have an effect on, you know, the parking availability in the town. So I think um, we used all the consultation responses as best we could. Um, we've done a lot of communication to get consultation responses back from the public and the businesses, um, not just through the online portal, um, but we obviously went out and we observed and we spoke to businesses, etc. cetera. Um, but it didn't stop at just you know, the outcome of just Queen Square. There are some follow-on actions, as, we, as I've just said, in sort of a phase two to help with that. Thank you. Paul. And just following up for that, uh, I'm delighted, Councillor Bird, that when you do now pop into Attleboro for a very short period of time, you can actually park in the Queen Square car park for that short amount of time, because that has not always been the case. And certainly we had some evidence before the trial started that a number of people who would be going into town in for short visits were unable to park. So in some ways, your, your comment reflects what the purpose of the trial was. Thank you. Thank you, David and then Linda. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, it's more of an observation, really. Um, obviously, Swapham was mentioned in the, uh, in the report. Um, and that has been a tremendous success in Swapham. We, we only have two hours, which apparently somebody told me was the length of time a lady would require to go and have her hair done and come back out again. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But anyway, it's been a tremendous success in Swapham. The churn is, is, is great. I haven't had any negative com uh, comments, but I think Ralph alluded to this a moment ago. But that is because we're fortunate in Swatham to have a free long-term stay car park, Theatre Street car park. So I think providing the alternative is quite important. Um, we've had visitors coming in who might be there for three or four hours and we could advise them to go to Theatre Street car park, um, which during the week, um, Saturday is another case altogether because of our Saturday market. But sat uh, during the week, there's always space in Theatre Street car park mm -hmm. as as an alternative. So I think it's important that, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see Attleborough going down this route, but I would say it is important to provide that, that alternative for those who want to stay uh, for a longer period. And part of that reason is initially we had lots of um, shop workers or workers in Swatham generally, who were parking there for you know 24 hours almost in, in the marketplace I'm referring to. So I think the alternative is, is very, very important and hopefully that will work out in that world. Thank you. Thank you. Linda. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to make the comment picking up from the team. Nobody likes change done unto them. It's taking people along with the change. And this is where the skills of Breckland teams, whatever topic it is, is in communicating, talking with town and parish councils and the residents because they live there they know what might work for them. It might not be 100% successful, but if it's better than what it was before, I fully support this. And Steve. Yes, thank you, um, Chairman. I would say that, you know, in a situation like this, you're never going to please everybody. In, in, in a town like Attleboro with the parking situation as it is, I think, um, I think the council, I think the officers and, and the cabinet member have been very brave to take this on because it, it's, uh, it's always quite a controversial thing, parking in the towns and taking this on and coming back with a, with a result and uh, which you know, has given some a majority feed, the feedback, the majority has been positive about what we've done. And, um, <clears throat> and again, what you've really done is you've managed to curtail this long-term parking for to you know for people who then want to get on the train or something and go to Norwich to park and park in there all day for nothing so you know I think it has been a success I've, I've been quite skeptical about it from the from the start and uh, I don't mind admitting that and I still have my issues with some of it but I think on the whole listen to Ralph and uh, and Paul this morning and, and knowing what goes on now, I think, you know, it has been a success and, uh, and well done. Thank you very much. And if I might add my penis worth as a local member, um, 
I mean, this has been a really good example of working with the town council. It was a town council request. We took it on. It's taken a long time to get to this stage because we've been careful in the way that it's been promulgated, because we've been, we've been careful. We were delayed by COVID as well, obviously. Um, and we've got back good feedback. 58% is more than, than some important votes in recent history have, have got to, to achieve significantly larger change. Um, and and the feedback the feedback anecdotally has been good and you know that there, there shouldn't be circumstances if there aren't enough car parking places that people can park their car and go on holiday for a week and leave their car there which unfortunately was not something that happened as a one-off we, we had people basically abandoning their cars for a week in some instances to jet off to ibiza and you know, that's not going to do the local businesses any good if you need the churn um, for people to be coming to the shops. So, so fully, fully support and endorse what's happened. And I'm, I'm really pleased we've reached the stage we have. And I look forward to, you know, further work in, in Attleborough's complex car parking environment. Um, are there any final comments from uh, either the team or members? Philip. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to know if you have been able to provide long-term parking for people who wanted to commute. I understand we don't want to support people going off to Ibiza, but I'd hope that the commuting journeys can be maintained. I, I'll let the cabinet member respond. And, and the answer is that there is long-term parking facilities, certainly for commuters, it's at the train station with a newly refurbished uh, and reasonably cost-effective car parking solution for long-term commuters. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you all. Um, we note the report uh, and we will move on then to item nine, which is disabled facility grants. Uh, Ellen, I think, is kicking this off. Thank you. Well, I think I'm kicking oh, off. Sorry, Kevin. sorry, Gordon. Thank That's you. two out of two I've got wrong. So uh, today. And I really do appreciate that members have a great deal of interest in this subject. And I'll also say that they're aren't many issues that have taken more of my time in the last several weeks than this particular issue. So what I'd like to say before Helen speaks is Breckland Council's role in the disabled facility grant process is to administer it, ensuring that the funding goes where it is needed. We work alongside Norfolk County Council and our contractors to deliver this vital service. The service enables our residents to live independently for longer, which improves their quality of life and in turn saves the wider health and social care system millions of pounds. Over recent years, Ellen, who will be presenting to you and her team have done an excellent job in transforming the service and the processes that Breckland use, meaning that we can get the money out of the door much more quickly so that our residents are not waiting for those essential works to be completed. As you will see through Ellen's presentation, the demand for this service is outstripping current funding. Collectively, we are continually applying pressure to the government through our local MPs and latterly through Lee Rowley, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, we also continue to work with Norfolk County Council to lever in additional funding and have been successful in obtaining funding for the Handy Person Scheme through the Breckland Health and Wellbeing Partnership. That's technically nothing to do with this, but is of course connected. We will continue to apply pressure to obtain further funding for this vital service. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ellen. <laughs> You do. Uh, thank you. An update on DFGs. First is the background. Can we have the slide, please? So since 2015, the funding um, has been incorporated within the Better Care Fund. Um, and so it's provided by central government to Norfolk County Council, who then distribute it to local housing authorities. Um, it's the DFG funding from the government is ring fenced and passported through to us. Um, and although 
the funding was incorporated into the um, Better Care Fund in 2015. It was there to ensure that adaptation is part of the integrated approach to housing, health and social care locally. Um, Norfolk's been ahead of the game in delivering DFGs through an integrated county and district team. So within my team here at Breckland, we do have two employees from Norfolk County Council, one occupational therapist and one assistant practitioner who are employed by the County Council that sit within our team and we provide an integrated service. From these integrated housing adaptations teams, they consist of staffing. Um, oh, I've just said that, sorry. <laughs> sorry to have repeated myself. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, why they're important? Obviously, they are so important to the people themselves who need the grants, you know, providing toileting facilities, showering facilities, those kinds of things. Um, it actually helps um, residents avoid a, a care home placement plan by four years. So it allows them to live within their home independently. Um, there's, it reduces the risk of, high, of, of falls and it offers a return on the investment of £3.17 for every pound spent um, due to falls and fall prevention. Um, and there's a social return on investment of £7.34 for every pound that's spent on a DFG. Um, in later life, the modifications made to um, people's properties prevent um, and reduce difficulties with activities of daily living by 75%. Um, holistic home intervention for lower income adults experience, experiencing difficulties with several areas of daily living, which combined reablement support, repairs, home adaptations, found that participants' physical functioning increased by 49%. Um, Depressive symptoms improved by 53% and difficulty with activities of daily living reduced by 75%. Um, a few more figures here. Um, average DFG of £7,000 in 2018 um, saved four years of residential care at £28,000 a year. Um, and also for a child, um, average DFG of £60,000 prevents future health care and care costs of £1.5 million per child. Um, so for the benefit of our communities and our health care budgets and our social care budgets, um, obviously there's a huge benefit to have a DFG. Um, Norfolk, as I said, through the Better Care Fund, distribute the funding. Um, here at Breckland, we get just over £1.3 million a year. Uh, typical ad adaptations will include level access showers, stair lifts, ramps, ceiling track hoists, ground floor facilities, door widening, through floor lifts, and rare occasions, extensions, when there's no other option but to extend the person's home. My team, um, pre-COVID, um, <coughs> there was a working arrangement with another local authority to deliver our DFGs um, at Breckland. In August 2021, um, my team was formed. Um, April 2021, the funding came to Breckland. Um, we went through a tender process. We recruited eight new contractors. Um, through 2021 20, to 22, um, we caught up with the COVID backlog. And by June 2022, we'd spent or committed all of the money that we could carry over from the COVID times um, and our budget for that year and most, most of the budget coming through to April this year. Um, we did keep back some funding for Priority 1 Pluses. Priority 1 Plus cases are cases that have been assessed by our occupational therapist that the work needs to be done urgently. So such examples are if there's somebody who's unable to safely access a toilet, but they have no carer at home. 
um, somebody who's wheelchair dependent, who spends time alone and is unable to ex exit their house in case of emergency, like a fire. Um, and a client who's unable um, to safety, safely complete stair transfers, who's also unable to temporarily sleep downstairs. So P1 plus cases, they were the emergency ones and we needed to keep some money back for those. Some photos of some typical adaptations. This is an adaptation to somebody's bathroom, um, provide ex accessible showering, um, a ramp to somebody's door to allow them access and egress. Um, this is a colour scheme for somebody who's severely visually impaired um, and needs a colour scheme throughout their house to be able to um, obviously use the bathroom and kitchen. Um, facts and figures from data. Um, in 21 to 22, we completed 176 grants. Um, in quarter one to quarter three of this financial year, 214. So you can see how, you know, obviously having the team in house has allowed us to be able to deliver those grants to the people of Breckland. Um, the remaining money from the 22 to 23 budget is 197,000 um, pounds. We've committed that now to people that have been waiting over the 2022 year. Um, information gathering, these are people that have inquired and we contact them to explain about the grants and also help with triage. This is a rolling number. So, you know, we'll get about 15 inquiries a week. Um, they will receive a phone call within two weeks. Occupational um, therapy assessment, there's 302 people waiting in February. There's now about 320. Um, we have more people apply and inquire about a grant than our occupational therapists can assess in a week. So that number <clears throat> will continue to increase. Um, the number of people at the moment where we're surveying and writing a specification of work, so we're 60 in February. Um, number of full applications improved and waiting for this year's budget in February, it was 96, that's increased. Um, and the cost of grants that we've approved for next year is 1.5 million. Um, if you can remember, our budget is 1.3. So there's more people obviously needing the service and waiting for the service than we've got the budget for. Um, and in February, there were 33 grants in progress at that time. Um, they've since been completed. Next slide. So obviously we're beginning a new financial year. Um, our funding won't be enough for the cases that are waiting, um, as I've just said, um, and for the people that approach us during next year. Um, there's an agreed process of prioritization of cases that have been waiting for adaptation. It's mainly due to um, medical need um, that we prioritize them, but we also prioritize people that have been waiting for many years. Um, and so we combine urgency with the waiting time. Um, and the next slide just shows, oh, the slide that's up at the moment. This shows the grant flow of us <coughs> raising a purchase order for the work to start. So just raised a purchase purchase orders for 28 grants at a cost of just over £300,000. That work will be starting this month through to April. Um, then in April 2023, we'll be raising purchase orders for 32 grants at a cost of £332,000. Um, uh, and seven grants of people that have been waiting for nearly two years of £24,000. We don't know how many urgent cases are going to come up. So what we're doing is we've raised purchase orders in April for these 32 plus seven grants. During the time between April and October, we will have more cases come in, some of them urgent. We don't know the cost of those urgent grants. 
for example, sometimes we're contacted by, um, you know, if there's been a road traffic accident and we'll be contacted by Sheffield Spinal Unit asking us to put in adaptations, we, ca we can't tell when those will come in. Um, we are going to review how many urgent cases have come in between April and September and in October this year, if we have enough money to approve some more of the people who are less urgent but have been waiting longer, then we will do so. We've got them waiting in the wings, ready to go, um, but we just need to see how many urgent cases come in between April and October before we can release that money. So we're holding on to it until October for that reason. Thank you very much. Um, just quickly, Gordon did say about the Handy Person Scheme. Um, that launched last week, and that is for people waiting on our waiting list for small jobs. It's called Safe at Home. Launched last week, small jobs of £300, £500, that sort of um, amount of money. We don't give people the money. We actually send the tradesperson round to do the work as well, so they don't have to find a tradesperson. Um, that's funded by the Health and Wellbeing Partnership, provided by Breckland, and it's for people who are on the waiting list to keep them out of hospital while they wait. Thank you. And Gordon, I think you had one last bit to add. Well, just one last thing. I mean, what you've seen there in, in some ways could be regarded as depressing, but in fact, this is a huge success story for this council. Until this council got its act together and started efficiently spending the money we were granted to by the council, we approved no more grants. We were still building up a backlog. But now, when someone comes in, we can deal with it. Our problem is that it's insufficiently funded. And that's the issue which I'm spending much of my time on, tackling our MPs and Ministers of State in Westminster to improve the funding that we get for this. Other councils, I can see you shaking your head, some of you, other councils in this area are not in fact spending the money. They are doing no more than we used to do. Other councils are coming to this team here and saying, can you help us to improve what we're doing so we can spend our money in the same way that you're spending it? So what, we've, what we're suffering from is the results really of success. And it is success, however you look at it. Look at how much we spent in 21, 22, and the things that changed in 22, so that now in 22, 23, we are achieving what we're achieving. And I just wanted to say that because this team, I believe, is doing an excellent job. They have caught up. We are now a beacon. We can show any council how to do this. And we're happy to do that. And at the same time, I am pressing um, every week through our MPs, through the, the, the uh, Secretary of States in Westminster to actually pay us the money to do the job. We need our, 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 our amount, our propose, and we don't know it will be yet, 1.3 million, but we assume it will be. Um, is going to be probably about 60% of what we'll need next year. So that is the situation we're in. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. David, and then Linda, and then Tim, and then Terry, and then C. Mike, and then Peter. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Well, some of you, or most of you will know that as a seconder of the motion at the last full council meeting, this is something that I also feel very passionate about, um, not only to help those that come to your department, and you're doing a great job, by the way, I, I, I endorse what Gordon said about the work that you do, but with very limited means. Um, and I guess as a question, my, my, pro my problem is, when are we going to get this money? And when do we know how much we're going to get? Because if it is 1.3 billion, we're still way behind, we'll still have a backlog, we will still be looking at ways of not, not, not looking at ways where we can't help, but in pr practically we'll have to say, you know, en enough is enough. We haven't got enough money, which I think is tragic because it's not only the people that you're helping, 
uh, to get back into their own homes. We're also, you know, not, not hugely, I understand that, but we're also helping the hospital system by letting people be discharged from hospital and give up their beds for people who need them to get back into their own homes. So my basic question is, because our motion that I seconded was denied at full council, how long have we got to wait? And, and, and what are we going to do if we, if we, in two, three weeks time, four weeks time, whatever it is, you know, we still don't have anything from Westminster, uh, either in terms of the amount or the time frame. And uh, it, 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 almost, <clears throat> excuse me, it almost makes me think that I need to present another motion to full council to, to see if they're gonna change their minds. It, it, it's very sad, I think, that that motion wasn't passed, but no, congratulations to the team, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, I know you're doing a very, very good job um, in very difficult circumstances. And the fact we're doing it well, uh, yes, we may be a beacon to, to other councils as to the way we're doing it. But if we don't get that financial support, in its entirety, then we're not going to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Gordon. Can I just answer that? I mean, officers may well correct me on this, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. Uh, we assume we're going to get 1.3 million. That was what was recorded before we started our fight for more money. Um, if that's all we get, then I assure you, once the government funding has been confirmed, I will be writing to every contact I can find in Westminster, and I'll be encouraging the leader of our council to do the same through the LGA. Can I tell you how much? No, I can't, except we believe it's going to be 1.3 million. Uh, can I tell you exactly when? No, I can't. But I assure you that once the funding has come, once we enter the new financial year, then we in this council will be chasing for more money. Thank you. Linda. Thank you, Chairman. I'm addressing this to the Cabinet member. Um, I'm a great believer that for every problem there is a solution. There might be several solutions. But I sat in this chamber last week at the Countywide Older People's Strategy Board. So there were representatives there from adult social services from Norfolk County Council, the Integrated Care Board, and members from every district across, um, across Norfolk. And DFGs were one of the topics that we talked about. And somebody from another council, to give them credit, came up with one option that could be looked at because everyone in that room acknowledged Breckland were really good because we spend all our money. Other people in that room admitted they didn't need their, some of their money. Why cannot all that money be put in one central pot and pulled from as and when needed? You know, um, Ellen raised the issue, if there was an emergency, say there was I don't know, another major flood in Yarmouth and properties had to be sorted out and adapted, the money would need to go there. Or there might be something in, in, in um, Breckland or South North, whatever. But instead of having all these little pots of money, some of which aren't used, why can't there be a central pot upon which we can all call? So I give you that challenge from that meeting, please. I can answer that. It is something we've thought of. In fact, we have uh, uh, applied to other councils for any spare money they've got. There are a couple of things from some councils, if they have any spare, it is very small. And all right, I agree, a small piece of money will satisfy one or two applicants or so on. But the real reason is because of the way the legislation is formed in giving us the money, if I were one of those councils, I would be reluctant to hand it over because there are all sorts of penalties for councils that don't meet their targets. Um, if you want to, I'll sit with you when we're not in a public meeting. I'll sit with any other member as well if they want to know and explain just what those reasons are. But there are reasons which I have pointed out to our MPs that mean it's not practical. Yeah, if any council is willing to give us their money, we can spend it to ease the burdens on the people of Norfolk. I am absolutely aware that as far as we're concerned as district councillors, it, it is the people who will get the relief. DHSS and NHS are recipients in terms of value. 
Thank you. Tim. Thank you. So I've never heard anybody speak against the works of the and obviously there is absolute total universal support in this council. It is essential work, it is vital for the citizens of Bretton. Now, clearly, there isn't enough money. You say on page 36, the funding for 23 24 will not be enough. And this has been a situation for some time, for some years. Money has been identified, though. Um, it's been identified specifically, um, a motion has been put to council, as you've already heard. There was a budget amendment where specific money was identified that could be transferred to uh, provide this essential service and yet it's always been rejected at council of Ambridge, yourself you you voted against these uh these sums of money coming into to support this function so why what everybody supports the need we've identified the money and yet it's not being transferred internally why <laughs> It is a difficult question. The, the, the amounts of money that were, sorry, it is a difficult question because the amounts of money were identified, were committed to other things, I believe. The, uh, the amounts of money that uh, I approved were small amounts. We do need a multi million pound package of money to effectively do this work. Thank you. Um, we can, uh, I'll comment as well on that in due course. Uh, Councillor Jeremy and then Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Chairman. I've got a couple of questions, if I may, <clears throat> for uh, Ellen and then a, a comment to, which is more political to uh, Gordon. Um, firstly, there was an interesting slide there, Ellen. I found the presentation very helpful, so thank you for that. Uh, the slide that jumped out was the one that listed the different amounts of funding per district. Um, what I've never been clear on is the formula for how the figures per district are arrived at, because uh, Breckton was uh, relatively high uh, compared to some of the others. Uh, others were, were you know, lower. Um, there must be a formula, but the formula clearly is broken because we're not getting sufficient money to meet the need. Uh, so that would be my first question. Um, the other is around uh, any attempts to forecast future demand. Um, you know, clearly this is, you know, we've provided DFGs for a while now, we've built up a fair amount of knowledge, I should think, on the number of applications that we receive each year, and therefore we can forecast, which would inform future funding, um, but also any forecasting around our ability to complete a certain number of works, I'm thinking specifically in relation to inflation, if we're receiving the same levels of money, but inflation is at the level it's at, Inevitably, we are going to be doing far few, fewer adaptations in the future. That is a significant concern of mine. Um, and then lastly, do we collect any data um, on the impact that uh, comes from the lack of funding that we received uh, to sort of counter the, you know, the argument that we're making to government and elsewhere? You know, it's very hard to uh, record decreased quality of life for people, and that will be the inevitable uh, outcome of uh, people sat waiting, but we could be measuring um, you know, X number of days, unnecessary days in hospital, for example. Uh, I would hope that the team, as part of Gordon's uh, efforts to uh, write to uh, everybody he knows, um, to get that extra money, we actually are building up a case of actually 200 grand difference this current financial year would deliver everybody that's been assessed as needed versus this is the impact on the social care sector. This is the impact on the NHS. So three questions. The first question about how the Better Care Fund distributes. Um, I haven't got the exact formula. I've asked them to provide it and obviously I can provide it to yourselves. Um, their broad answer is it's based on demographics. Um, but obviously I can provide the formula when I receive it from the Better Care Fund to everybody. Um, second question about forecasting. If we were to provide a grant for everybody on our waiting list currently, and that includes people that are waiting to be assessed by an occupational therapist, we'd need 5.5 million this year. 1.3 doesn't cut it. Um, the other question about forecasting future demand. This is our first April to April as a team that we've been running grants here. 
we can do some forecasting um, just based on this financial year. When we started as a team in August 2021, we also had the COVID backlog of cases that weren't dealt with during COVID time. So 21 to 22 was a difficult year. It was half a year. And also it was based on a lot of people that had obviously been waiting a long time. So it was difficult to forecast using that. Um, your question about the inflation, costs are going up for everything. Um, a stair lift, components, um, the digital components are made in China. A lot of the um, metal components are made in Germany and a stair lift has gone up in the last seven months by 20%. Um, sanitary wear, um, a lot of sanitary wear is made in Italy. Again, the prices have gone up. We have obviously labor shortage for our contractors, fuel and transport issues for our contractors. Their prices will go up um, to reflect that. We're having a meeting tomorrow to look at forecasting how um, how much the grants that we've currently got and forecasted for for this financial year coming are going to cost us um, compared to the quotes that we got for them, obviously, in the past of year to six months. So even the grants that we're going to be doing April onwards, the cost of those will increase. Um, and I think I've covered all the questions. Yeah, but I will get back to you about the Better Care Fund and their formula for how we're allocated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilkinson, I'll come back to you, David. Has anyone got their mic on? I'm an mine on. I'm the chairman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. <laughs> chairman. Um, I'd just like to say um, we have got a team now. I, I remember back in 2015, I don't think we had a Pacific team. Uh, Terry might be able to correct me. If, um, and so therefore it was because I championed the um, handyman service and we did put a few tens of thousands of thousands to that, which did help people even back then in 2015 coming out of hospital into their own home. And that's an important asset I feel we should be looking at now to, to help with your waiting list. And I would imagine it's frustrating for the Breckland team as well, the outside bodies, uh, when you're waiting for assessments, it is, is not down to you, to you guys. And then when an emergency comes in, it's hard to evaluate that over someone who's been waiting 18 months or whatever, you know. Um, so I think if you are looking at that, make sure you are looking at that. As if any little things with the handyman service could help in the short term. Um, and and, and to, as I understand as well, is it um, <clears throat> each adaption equates to around about an average of £30,000? And if it does, then money is what we've mentioned at Council in an amendment to the policy the other week. Um, it's not going to go anywhere at all to reduce a list of over 100 people waiting. Can I answer that? Um, yeah, the average adaption in 2018 was £7,000. Um, that's nationally. Um, obviously, with prices increasing, it's now between nine and £11,000 nationally. 
Thank you. Um, David. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just two points, really. I'd just like to remind the members of the ONS committee, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, what I said at the council meeting with regards to the comments made by our leader. And basically, in his address to the full council, it was a question of continuing highlighted the council's commitment to those in need. And quite frankly, we're not doing that. And I endorse everything that uh, Councillor Jeremy had to say about it. Uh, forgive me for not knowing the protocol. Um, I should do perhaps after four years here, but nevertheless, I don't. Is it within the power of this committee to put a proposal back to full council to reconsider their decision? So I'll, I'll answer that first. This committee can make recommendations to council or cabinet, depending on what it is that we're recommending and where those powers lie within this council. Um, so the short answer is yes. Uh, we haven't got the motion that you refer to before the committee, so you would need to reconstitute whatever your recommendation was, but that would not prevent you from including the wording of your motion if that was something that you sought to do. Um, are you going to be bringing forth anything immediately or shall I give you a couple of minutes to consider? I have a couple of points I, I'd like to make anyway. So very good. And Tim, I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll give way so that you, you can speak okay. first. Um, I, I'm uh, seeking a correction to the record, uh, Councillor Bambridge. You indicated that the uh, funds that uh, were put forward in the motion to council and the budget amendment um, were for allocated, were already allocated elsewhere. That is not the case. They were from unallocated funds. So I'd like you to correct the record, please. Can I clarify, Councillor Burt? Are you referring to unallocated capital funds? Okay, thank you. The actual proposal, Chair, was that the money would come out of the new homes bonus. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll allow you to speak, Gordon, and then. Uh, well, I was just going to say, Chairman, I, I will come back with a response on that. Okay, fine. Um, so the two points I wanted to make on this, and firstly, again, thank you very much for your presentation. The team does an excellent job. I won't repeat ad nauseum all the good things that other members have said. Um, you mentioned that you think we're going to receive approximately £1.3 million. It's your best estimate, and that that, that would represent around 60% of your total requirement for the year, is that correct? I think the figures Ellen gave after means it will probably be close to 40%. 1.3 million would be 40% of what we require. Close to that, which would mean that the gap in one year would be around 1.6 million pounds. Okay, so that brings me on to my second point, which is uh, Breckland has to juggle and these are my personal points. I'm not speaking as chairman here. I'm speaking simply as a member of scrutiny. Breckland has to juggle a huge number of statutory and non-statutory commitments within a very limited budget. For years now, central government have reduced either through inflation or absolutely the amount of money that they provide to local councils and Breckland is no exception. I won't repeat ad nauseum the political points I would make in my political capacity about Breckland being better than other councils in having managed that reduction in money and referencing all of the good work that we've done in various areas. But what I would say is that 1.6 million pounds a year, which would ultimately have to come from a revenue budget, albeit that you could plug some of it initially from a capital budget, is not an amount of money that Breckland, in my view, could find for this or for any other project by itself. I will allow you to come back, Derry, and argue with me shortly. Um, <laughs> The second point I would make is if Breckland seeds this ground and says we will make the local taxpayers of Breckland fund this, which is ultimately what that decision would, would be, we will set a precedent for central government not to listen to this council when we say we need more money. We will set a precedent for them to say, well, fine. In fact, we feel like we can move yet more money from your council to somewhere else because you're clearly able to fund it. And ultimately people in Breckland will be worse off. So I think that our position has to be that we get more money from central government. I don't deny at all the points that have been made. It would be hugely valuable for us to have this money and to be able to invest it into this area. But I don't believe that this council alone should or can bear that burden. 
the last point, and this is one which I will make now, but I think will be a matter for the newly constituted committee following the elections in May, is that I believe that this council through this committee should consider calling in either or and or the MP for South West Norfolk, the MP for Mid Norfolk to answer why we are getting so little money around disabled facility grants, and also if necessary to invite the Secretary of State or the relevant minister to come up here and explain also why they think, given the numbers that we've heard today, that money isn't being allocated more effectively to this area. Um, and those, those are all of my points. Uh, Terry, I'll let you come back and then um, if there's a proposal coming from the floor, if I could hear that and we can we can look at that. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, forgive me, I can't recall if you were at um, EVA full council when we've debated DFGs twice, um, but the amendment to the budget um, was uh, purely for £200,000, which was for the difference. There is a difference between uh, DFGs that have been assessed and quantified and the significant number, I think 320, I think was quoted from memory, uh, of people on a waiting list but not yet assessed. The amendment was specifically to implement all of everybody that's been assessed and costed to deliver them, not the, the wider 1.6 or however many of people yet to be assessed, purely to implement everybody that's already been assessed and confirmed that their need is valid. I, I understand the point. I don't think it changes my arguments. Um, uh, Chairman, can I remind the committee of something before you go to a vote? Well, we don't have anything to vote on yet, but yes. Uh, can I just remind members of my the first sentence of my statement before Ellen's presentation? And that is that Brecklands Council's role in the DFG process is to administer it. That's our role in the process. Right, I'm, I'm going to give a final opportunity for members to bring forward any proposals if they wish to do so. Otherwise, we will note the report. I'm seeing no indications from the floor. Very good, Councillor Jeremy, as you see fit. Um, thank you then, that report is noted. Thank you for coming and making that presentation. That takes us on to item 10, nutrient neutrality. Uh, Sarah and Simon, I believe you are Simon. Great, I got it wrong third time. Okay, um, kick us off. We, we aim to confuse Chairman. Um, so nutrient neutrality, there is a presentation which was attached to the agenda. Um, it was a, a lengthy and quite wordy presentation, um, which I think reflects the complexity of the, the, the issue and the fact that it's an ever-changing topic as well at the, the moment. Um, hopefully Ruth's able to, to get it up. I am going to also work on the basis that um, hopefully members have had an opportunity to look through it before the meeting, so I won't go through it in detail. I'll just pick out the, the salient points and um, update where necessary. What I would say is that we're now at the first year anniversary of when this was introduced, the, the 16th of, of March. And um, just to be slightly flippant, uh, development management planners noted that with a, a cake and uh, a reflection on, on a year of uh, turmoil and uncertainty within the, 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 the planning process, which is now becoming clearer um, with a light coming up rapidly nearer to the end of the, from the end of the tunnel. So next slide, please. So just to sort of clarify the, the background on this, um, this was brought about through work by the Environment Agency and Natural England, which identified that um, UK rivers are in a critical condition. Members will doubtless be aware that the chalk rivers in Norfolk are, are of international status and relatively rare examples, the Wensum and the, the, the rivers running into the broads particularly. 
what, what it meant was that we weren't able to determine planning applications within the catchment of those rivers. And the implications of that are set out in that, in that slide. So effectively, uh, 10,000 homes across Norfolk were stalled. Breckland, that's around 1,000 dwellings. And in terms of the local plan period itself, that's going to be well over 2,000 dwellings. There's been a slight reduction in planning applications and fees over this period are approximated to, to be around a million pounds. That's the, the local plan period. There's an impact on affordable housing and there's also an impact on uh, the five-year land supply, potentially. What it may well end up doing is putting pressure on areas that are outside catchment, but which would generally be considered to be inappropriate <coughs> to grant planning permission. There is an impact on the, the local economy. Um, anecdotally and empirically, there have been areas previously affected by nutrient neutrality where the construction industry was significantly impacted. And once those solutions were in place, took at least 12 months to get back into full, full operation again. There has been a response in terms of legislation from central government. The levelling up and regeneration bill requires water companies to upgrade the wastewater treatment works by 2030. And I'll come on to the role of Anglian water um, later on, Chairman. Also, Natural England have also been tasked with finding solutions to um, this issue. And again, I, I will come on to that in more detail later on. They have been given funding to enable them to do this as well. So next slide, please. So the Norfolk um, districts um, formed a nutrient neutrality group, um, which was based around both um, policy planners, but also around development management and at um, senior manager level to establish a way forward um, to enable us to start granting planning permission. One of the first pieces of work that um, was undertaken was funded by grants from central government, and that was for Royal Hasconing to start bringing together an evidence base that would establish the level of mitigation required across the affected districts in um, Norfolk, a way of calculating that on a development by development basis, and also to start looking at short term potential mitigation solutions that could be brought forward relatively quickly. They're also doing a piece of work to, to look at long-term mitigation as well, which I will come on to, to later. One of the things that has come out of the Royal House Coding work is an anticipation that those credits will cost each dwelling between £7,000 and £10,000. Those would be paid by developers and ultimately will be funded either by landowners in terms of land value or by house purchasers in terms of um, house prices. Thank you. Next slide. So some of the um, conclusions that came out of the report, um, I apologize, I'm not a chemist. I don't know many of the, the technical elements of this and I'm happy to, to take questions away but phosphorus is harder to remove than the nitrogen. There are, are less ways of, of doing that. Many of the options have um, an insufficient measurable evidence of, of um, nitrogen and phosphorus removal. And also it's unclear whether some options would meet with Natural England approval. And I would just like to say that this work has been undertaken with Natural England being part of the process that, um, that the cooperation and that collaboration is key to being able to, to deliver solutions. There has been work done in terms of the, the costs, particularly having regard to the fact that any mitigation options have to be delivered and monitored and enforced 
um, in perpetuity. And one of the big debates with Natural England at the moment is, is what exactly is meant by perpetuity. It ranges between 80 and 120 years. Um, at the moment, Natural England's view is at the top end of, top end of that range, but there is still discussion and debate going on around that. So the report identified some short-term solutions which are set out below. And this is work that the um, Norfolk Group is looking at in terms of its ability to, to deliver some of that work, but also more importantly, to go out and encourage landowners, developers, et cetera, to also do that work. Next slide, please. So the Royal Haskoning report was a highly technical report. It identified the, the loads per district over the local plan period. One of the key pieces of work that Royal Haskoning did was refine the calculator used to calculate um, nutrient loads for a development and within each district by adopting what's called the Norfolk calculator. It's fair to say that um, if you use the Norfolk calculator, the mitigation levels tend to be less than if you use the Natural England calculator. Whilst Natural England haven't endorsed the, the Norfolk calculator, they have indicated that they will not challenge its, its use. There is also work being done to establish what exactly those levels will be after work has been carried out to the permits for each wastewater treatment work within each district. Have the next slide, please. In addition to the work carried out by Royal Haskoning, Breckland, in partnership with the Wendling Beck Environmental Project and with the Nature Conservancy Council, had work done by Ricardo Consulting, who are also experts in nutrients and mitigation. What we wanted to find out specifically was the extent of mitigation required by development within Breckland and how well placed the Wendling Beck project was to enable that to be a main source of mitigation for those developments. When I refer to developments, we are essentially looking at the, the backlog of applications and dwellings that we have in our system at the moment. There will still need to be work done to enable us to continue to provide mitigation for schemes coming forward. What the report established was that the Wendlinbeck project can provide mitigation for all Breckland stalled applications. Strangely, except for North Elmham and Gately, which is due to locational reasons and how um, the water flows run, and also for um, land using private uh, treatment plants. This was based on taking agricultural land out of use and is based on 469 hectares of farmland at Wendling Beck and what that would be able to, to mitigate. We're also looking at additional measures within the Wendling Beck land of riparian buffer zones and floodplain reconnection which can help to, as it says, they renaturalize river channels and potentially provide additional mitigation. Have the next slide, please. So what the Ricardo report did was it provided a map of mitigation solutions available at Wendling Beck. And again, it must be stressed that Wendling Beck is only able to provide mitigation for the Wensum catchment. Mitigation has to be location specific. Breckland, along with North Norfolk as well, is in a unique position in terms of um, being able to provide mitigation within its district. The downside of that is that um, districts such as Norwich in particular, which are downstream of the, the Wensum, will require uh, mitigation within the Wensum catchment to enable them to bring um, development forward as well, which gives an indication of the, the, the pressure there is going to be on mitigation schemes within Breckland and, and North Norfolk. 
there's also been work done in relation to the stacking of mitigation credits around nutrient neutrality, biodiversity net gain, carbon capture and flood restoration. The Wendling Beck project was originally designed and the business plan was calculated on the basis of it providing biodiversity net gain credit. And that's the basis on which their model has been built. If they were only able to provide nutrient neutrality credits, that would not be financially and commercially viable for them, and they would not be able to go down that route. Recent guidance has indicated that the stacking and bundling of credits is acceptable, and therefore it is now a valid business model for Wendling Beck to go down, go down this route. Have the next slide, please. So what the, record, the Ricardo report essentially established was that um, it used the, the Natural England calculator, which, as I said previously, provides higher mitigation levels than the, the Norfolk calculator. So these are very much worst case scenarios that the mitigation required is higher in the year than the, the, the Wensum due to the, the permit level for, for Dirham and that it can provide mitigation for all stalled applications except Gately, and as I mentioned previously, but isn't on the slide, North Elmham as well. Next slide, please. So as I set out, the Royal House Going Report set out short-term mitigation options. One of those was riparian buffer strips together with reed bed filters. That's a relatively quick win um, and essentially you're, you're looking at, at buffers of between 15 to 20 meters in, in depth uh, along um, riverbanks or along the, the edge of fields, which can filter um, nutrients out as they make their way towards the, 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 the water course. They're relatively easy to, to set up and can be reasonably effective. They have to be maintained and they have to be, be, be monitored. They are also very location specific and location dependent as well. There is an opportunity for, for Breckland here to provide some riparian buffers. And we've been working with our colleagues in the, the, the estates um, and facilities department to actually identify that land. And I'll come on to that in, in, in more detail in a in a minute. Have the, the next slide, please. Another option is taking land out of agricultural use. And as you can imagine, for a lot of landowners, that would be a fairly um, big step for them to, to take. It is not unreasonable for landowners to want to um, take a return from their land, that, that their land has to, to pay its way. So there has to be a commercially viable business model associated with this. Um, it's possible to provide cover crops or to leave land fallow. Um, it's good for nutrient removal, but it doesn't necessarily help with, with phosphorus um, removal. It also is, takes up a huge amount of, of land to enable it to, to be effective. Thank you. Next slide. So again, one of the short term mitigation options is to look to do work in the short term on wastewater treatment plants and their, their permit limits. The, um, the, the, the Norfolk Task Force is working closely with Anglian Water who have really started stepping up to the plate in terms of their looking to, to fund works to um, the wastewater treatment works within the, the district and the, the county and to support the, the, the joint venture, which I will come on to in, in, in a minute. What that means that there will be the ability to remove phosphorus and nitrogens from the, the watercourses. 
There are several ways of, of, of doing that as set out there. The preferred options by both Anglian Water and by Natural England are to look at natural based solutions, which tends to be through the use of integrated construction wetlands. It is expensive. It is unclear who would pay for this. Um, the water companies are looking to, to do it, but there is a debate whether that money could be recovered through developer, developer contribution via the Section 106 process. Have the, the next slide, please. One of the ways that other districts are looking at providing short-term mitigation is in the retrofitting of dwellings and other buildings to, to save water. Again, that is something that has to be monitored, maintained and enforced over a significant length of, of time and isn't something that can really be done for open market housing. It can be done through councils that have a housing stock or by working with registered providers. It can only be used with treatment works that have a permit limit that is close to their capacity. It is known that Norwich City are looking at this in terms of their stock holding and are awaiting approval from Natural England to enable them to move forward with that. In terms of Breckland, Flagship has 889 dwellings at, at Deerham um, and the Deerham Wastewater Treatment Works has a permit limit. So there is the possibility for Flagship to retrofit and provide credits. The debate will be whether those credits are used by Flagship to enable them to bring development forward or whether they're able to, to bring those to the market and move other developments forward, particularly affordable housing. Um, developments. Next slide, please. There's also work being done to look at old um, private treatment plants and septic tanks and work with landowners and ho householders to deliver new treatment plants, which would release credits and enable us to, to use them and sell them through the joint venture to fund development going forward. One of the issues around that is identifying those old septic tanks and old package treatment plants and how that is front funded to enable those works to take place in order to bring that mitigation and those credits forward. In terms of Breckland, it is something that can be used for small developments in, in rural locations. Wendling Beck are currently in discussions with some landowners that have package treatment plants and old septic tanks that are prepared to look at um, renewing those and bringing those credits forward. And Wendling Beck would look at providing some of the, the front funding there to enable that to, to be, brought, be brought forward. Next slide, please. So there are other mitigation options, increased use of SUDs. Certainly from the, the end of this year, SUDs will be um, a mandatory requirement within developments over a certain size. Um, there is work to be done in terms of the establishment of SUDs approval boards, which is likely to sit with the, the lead local flood authority who will need to get involved in, in, in this issue. Silt traps, we are working with the internal drainage board to look at how silt traps could be used on, on developments or on existing land areas to provide uh, mitigation credits. It is effective, um, but it does take a lot of monitoring and maintenance to, to keep those effective. Wet woodlands, again, very effective, but the monitoring and enforcement of that is something that still needs to, to be worked through. There are some industries where if they stopped operating would provide instant credits, but again, it's balancing the needs of the, the landowners and the operators of these businesses to be able to make a viable return from them. And also the, the fact that there are other economic implications. If you take fish farms, for example, out of out of operation. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of the, the Wendling Beck project, this is roughly 500 hectares of, of land that is looking at rewilding agricultural land, that is looking at um, restoring floodplains and providing mitigation for both nutrient neutrality and for biodiversity net gain. Next slide, please. As I mentioned previously, Breckland owns land within the, the, the catchment and along the, the, the Deerham stream and, and Wendling Beck. And very recently, this is something that um, Natural England is starting to look at as to, in terms of their mitigation schemes, working with Wendling Beck and with ourselves to see whether this is something that they could take forward. I know that um, Natural England and their advisors met with um, officers from Breckland on this land earlier this week, and, and the outcome was relatively positive. So it re remains to be seen how we take that forward. There needs to be commercial discussions, as well as an understanding of exactly what level of mitigation that can be provided. Next slide, please. That shows the other area of land controlled by Breckland. The, the opportunities for that are less than the, the Ted Ellis land on the, uh, on the previous slide. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, the opportunities that Breckland has, we have the ability to use land that we own and control in conjunction with, with Wendling Beck. That would allow us to explore opportunities around the use of wetlands, riparian buffer strips, reed beds, et cetera, to, to filter the runoff from housing and then provide credits. If we were to use all of the, the Breckland land, that'd be around eight hectares, which would equate to approximately 500 dwellings. There's still a lot of work to be done in understanding how this will be brought forward around monitoring, enforcement, et cetera. We have the, the, the evidence, and as I mentioned previously, Natural England are actively looking at that in conjunction with ourselves and Wendling Beck. Wendling Beck itself, one of 12 projects across the country, which is being fast-tracked by um, the Natural England scheme. There are other opportunities in terms of land at Billingford, et cetera, that we can, we can look at. Um, I met with Natural England and, and the owners of um, Billingford Lakes recently to see what opportunities there are there. So we continue to work not only with our, our Norfolk colleagues, but also with Wendling Beck, other private landowners and with Natural England to seek to deliver that mitigation. So next uh, slide, please. So members will be aware that um, on 13th of March, Breckland's cabinet um, agreed in principle to join the Norfolk Joint Venture Project, which is a joint venture between ourselves, Broadland, South Norfolk, North Norfolk, um, Norwich, and Anglian Water um, to act essentially as a, a credit broker to allow people to, to use the vehicle to, to sell credits. It is also looking to work with landowners and other operators to encourage them to bring those credits forward as well. It's not a vehicle to deliver that mitigation, it's there to, to try and, and facilitate it. Um, and to, to make it more straightforward for landowners, et cetera, to, to sell their, their credits. There are still issues to, to be resolved. Um, how to apportion credits between districts is, is one of the key elements, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, that some districts are able to, to provide mitigation more readily than, than others. So there has to be a degree of cooperation and collaboration there and taking a, a holistic Norfolk approach. We also need to, to work out how the schemes are delivered and controlled through the, the planning process. Um, and also not only do we need short-term mitigation, but we need to look at long-term mitigation as well, which will inevitably mean the use of land as integrated wetlands, which take 18 months to, to two years to, 
take through both the planning process and also for them to, to be up and running. One thing that is necessary to stress is that mitigation has to be in place before properties can be um, occupied. Next slide, please. So we, we've discussed briefly the, the Natural England work. They're identifying sites at the moment through their consultants, and they are looking to speak to, to landowners, including auth local authorities and county councils and, and, and other public bodies to enable that land to be, for, be brought forward. Natural England would provide the, the funding and the, the work and have a model that would enable them to essentially enter into long leases on land to be able to bring those credits forward. So next slide, please. So just to, to clarify, there are private schemes out there. Wendling Beck is the, the key one within our, our district. Um, we also have um, developers looking at providing their own schemes. So where landowners and developers can provide development with their own mitigation on site, that is something that we would encourage. And we are working with some key developers to enable that to, to be brought forward. And I think that's the last slide. I apologize for the length of that, but there was a, a lot to, to get through, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. On the, with the caveat that any technical questions I may well have to take away. I'm not too good on nitrates and phosphorus. Thank you. Um, Tim. There we go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I need to first say I, I fully recognise the need for a solution here and, and a solution quickly. Um, but I'd like to start by saying I have similar concerns to this uh, that I have with carbon credits and carbon trading. Um, it's it, it ha those have generally turned out to be a poor societal solution because it allowed the rich to buy out of their obligations. So that was my starting point from the history of an equivalent type of uh, uh, arrangement. I have a few questions, if I may. Um, the first one is a very relatively simple: is where do the phosphates and nitrates go? Um, I, they, if they're locked up in the biomass, as in a reed bed. Do we need to do something like harvest that so that it's not released later? And Simon, like you, I am not a biochemist. However, I have been shown uh, one of the, the chemical uh, equations, which was entirely reversible for um, sequestration of uh, phosphorus, and then actually it would go back again. So I think we do need to establish what sort of work is needed to be able to make sure that we have sequestered these permanently, and it's not just a, a, a very temporary solution. Um, the credits that we're offering seem to have a very significant monetary value, and that's been sort of created out of nowhere. Um, what is the legal weight being given to those credits, and, and how long will they be tradable for? Um, Another one is how, how are we going to ensure that what we're doing is transparent um, and that, that, that there's no uh, sort of secret deals behind uh, closed doors, um, you know, that the market is free and open to everybody? Um, and who's going to oversee any disputes or check that the correct levels of phosphates and nitrates are removed? And uh, just a specific one on the um, uh, the Breckland owned land in Deerham. Um, Scarning Fen and the water meadows at Wasbridge, these, these are already weapons and they already have reed beds. So how do they suddenly become credits? Because it appears as if this, uh, what's already happening has suddenly become uh, to have some value. Um, and again, that reflects me back to where I started from originally on the carbon credits and the carbon trading scheme in that actually, I'm not saying it is, but it has the potential to be dodgy. Simon, I'm sure you'll be able to answer all of those straight away. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the first point that, that you made around carbon trading and, um, and credits generally, I don't 
disagree with, uh, uh, with with your conclusion in relation to those. I think the big difference with nutrient neutrality and to a degree with biodiversity net gain is that they have to be much more localized. It's not possible, for example, in terms of nutrient neutrality to buy a credit from Lincolnshire for a development in, in Durham. It, it has to be within the, the catchment so that the benefit is locally met. So I'm, I'm much more confident and, and comfortable that um, it, it will that there will be less abuse of that 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 system really. Um, in terms of where do the phosphorus and nitrates go, I, I'm not able to to answer that from a technical point of view. I don't have the knowledge. What I do know is that the solutions that we're working on and looking at are being done in collaboration with um, scientists and um, and consultants that, that do know the, the the technical answers and and issues around that and it is also being sense checked by natural england what we will have to do whether it's breckland whether it's the joint venture whether it's natural england or or, or just a, a landowner a acting on, on their, their their own benefit will have to be sure that the schemes work that they are endorsed by by natural england and that they can be enforced and monitored in 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 perpetuity um, that i can't turn around to you now and say that we have a process in place that will enable us to guarantee that that is still very much something that we are are working with we're taking examples from other areas of the country where this is already in place such as the solent somerset etc and trying to come up with um with, with, with locally based um, solutions to, to that. Um, the process in terms of the, the, the planning system is that before planning permission can be granted for development that is affected by nutrient neutrality, that mitigation will need to be clear. The, 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 the decision maker will need to be sure that that mitigation is able to be in place before those properties are, are occupied that it's in the right location, that it's suitable, and that proper monitoring and enforcement will take place over the required time period, whether that's 80 or 120 years. Um, it will be clear where those credits are, are coming from, and because we, we will need to be able to, to say to the decision maker, whether that's officers or whether that's members in the committee, that locationally, this is a suitable solution. And unless we know where it is, we can't answer that 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 question. Um, just in terms of your, the the, the um, question around the the Breckland land, all, all I'm doing is um, I think I can make it's my soft phone. Sorry about that. So in terms of the, the Breckland land, I know that was visited by um, Natural England and by um, their consultants earlier this week, tail end of last week, and that there are opportunities there notwithstanding the current land uses that are there. I've yet to see what the details of that are, but they seem to believe that there are additional opportunities there. But I... I I assume from my discussions with them on other sites that they will now need to go to a stage where they've done the initial visit, they've established potential, they then need to do proper feasibility and a proper business case as well, because there, there will be a cost benefit analysis to, to, to this, and that will be based on the, 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 the number of credits and the mitigation that can be brought forward on on those areas of land and i think it's probably fairly sensible that if breckland is able to contribute that we should be able to do so through uh, agreement with uh, with natural england the, in terms of the the the, the credits that they will be secured through um section 106 agreements in terms of the planning process um I think that the main concern that we have is if those credits are not brought through in time, what are the implications for planning consents? We have to give the credits weight, providing they are shown to be locationally 
right and being able to be brought forward within the time period within which they will be required and that they can be monitored and enforced. That, that, that they are the way of resolving this issue effectively. Thank you. Any other questions from members? Peter? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, that was a brilliant explanation of this, the, your um, report today, Simon. Um, the, the, North, the North Joint Venture Scheme and the, the authorities coming together, have you had meetings so far? And um, the terms of reference, have they been set up yet? And when they are, would there be a time scale where we could move developments on? Thank you, Councillor. Yes, we, we have had meetings. Um, we, we had one in the Deering Room just uh, Thursday last week with all the, the, the members of the, um, the, the joint venture, um, including um, two senior representatives from Anglian Water as well. Um, the um, heads of terms has been drafted, but not formally agreed. Um, and there is still work to be done on those following a, a resolution by, by Norwich, which, which raised one or two issues um, from their point of view. We're reasonably comfortable with the, the, the heads of terms, but we'll continue to work with partners to, to ensure that, that, that Norwich are able to, to join the, the joint venture. We're currently in the process of finalising the, the business case um, and the model. Uh, the business modelling to ensure that we're able to actually continue to bring credits forward and develop a pipeline for those credits. I can't sit down now and say when those credits will start becoming available. Um, we're working with Anglian Water to look at work that they can do. We're also working with other landowners such as Wendling Beck who are happy to provide credits to the joint venture if, if it works to look at um, work around septic tanks, uh, et cetera, which can be fairly easy wins. So yes, we, we meet very regularly. Um, the Norfolk groups are also meeting on a regular basis. We also have an internal group um, based around the planning service that, that also meets every other week to make sure that we're continuing to keep on top of it and have consistency within, uh, within our approach with other districts. Thank you. Uh, Philip. Thank you, Chairman. Um, could you give an idea of how much um, emphasis there is going to be on upgrading water treatment plants? You mentioned 2030. Is that for extra capacity, all existing capacity? And how will that impact on the value of these credits? Because as we get closer to 2030, if the water is going to be improved on waste treatment sites, presumably the credit's going to have less value. I, I don't know the answer in response to the, the, the final point. What, what I can say is that Anglin Water are a key part of the, the joint venture and are looking to bring forward improvements to wastewater treatment works at the earliest possible opportunity. The 2030 um, deadline relates to larger wastewater treatment works. There is a deadline of 2027 for some smaller um, works that, that, where they need to, to meet the, the, the best technical available limits. Um, and one of the, the key um, drivers for the joint venture is to enable Anglian Water to do those works, which will generally be nature-based and land-based solutions. So there is no desire to Put more concrete and chemicals into in, into the, the, the treatment works. So they are looking at uh, more land-based solutions, and it's hoped that those can be be brought forward in 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 the next twelve to eighteen months. The exact timetable is still being worked out, and we will endeavour to update members as, as and when we're we're able to um, in relation to the work that they're they're doing. I have to say, last time we we reported this um we were very critical of the approach that anglian water were taking i think it's fair to say that 
um, they are now working very proactively with the, the Norfolk districts to try and resolve this subject to their own commercial um, requirements and their own governance as well. Um, and I do know that they were taking the resolution to join the joint venture to their board last Thursday. I'm not, a, I'm not aware that that, 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 that didn't, didn't work. I think I would have been told if it failed. Um, I'm going to assume that uh, they, they, they resolved to, to join the joint venture, which I think is a, a significant boon to it. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, uh, I just wondered if there's any legal requirement coming from central government to force Anglian water to get to a certain capacity. There, there are requirements within the draft um, levelling up and regeneration bill, but until that gets royal assent, that, that those legal requirements aren't necessarily in place. The Environment Agency will also have their own requirements, as I say, the, the, the technical of achievable limits have to be met by 2027, and those are legal requirements. One other point I felt was how are we going to encourage developers not to sit there and wait till the wastewater treatment plant capacity is available? I think that's a really interesting point, and that, that's one that we have been discussing long and hard within the, the, the joint venture group and the, the, the Norfolk group. Um, the, the, it is hoped that the work that Anglian Water are going to be doing within the rest of this decade will mean that by the end of it, there will be very little additional mitigation required to enable us to, to mitigate for, for nutrients. Um, we don't yet have a real answer other than that if they do wait, then economically that, will, that, that won't help them. And I think what we're trying to do is provide options in the interim that are relatively straightforward. Um, but I, I, we're wrestling with it, but I don't have an answer for you at the moment, I'm afraid, Councillor. Sorry. Thank you. Any final points? Thank you very much, Simon. The report is noted. Um, item 11 is outside body feedback. Do any councillors have any outside body feedback they want to bring to the committee's attention? Seeing none, thank you. Item 12 is scrutiny call-ins. We have none. Item 13 is the work programme. Um, we can discuss the work programme, but I think that might be better suited for uh, whatever the newly constituted committee and um, chairman and whoever survives the uh, the coming the coming rain. Um, so we'll pass on from item 13, which only leaves item 14. So for those of you who survive May, uh, the next meeting will be 8th of June. Um, and thank you very much for your attendance. Have a good day.